The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. And my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Forever. Forever. Eastern Hills, so glad that you are with us this weekend, that you're spending part of your weekend here together. Now, I have to say this up front. This is a little bit of a weird weekend for a few reasons. First of all, the Broncos don't play this weekend. So I can guarantee they won't lose this weekend. (laughs) That has not been a guarantee much this year, okay? Secondly, we got an extra hour of sleep last night. Come on, and I could tell because you guys were into it this morning, right? Worship was amazing, uh, so good. And then the third thing is that right now, this weekend, Phil and Alyssa and their kids are uh, out in Northern California at Menlo Church. And they've been in a process of mutual discernment between them and Menlo to see if Phil is going to be their future lead pastor. And so while that's kind of a a weird thing for us to be going through, we want to just pray for Phil and Alyssa this morning. I hope you've been praying with them through this process over the past few weeks, but I want to just pray for them this morning as well. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for being here with us, for the things that we're going to talk about, for the things that we're going to share together and experience together here. Lord, I also want to pray for Phil and Alyssa and their kids as they're out in California, God. Lord, we just pray that your will would be done in this situation. God, we want Phil to listen to your call and your voice. We want what's best for Menlo Church and what's best for Eastern Hills and all of those things. God, we know that you are in control, that you love those churches, our church, better than we do. And God, we thank you for that. God, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Now, uh, one other interesting thing that is going on is that this week, Tuesday, is an election, midterm elections. So if you are coming today and you're like, man, I hope Kendall tells us who to vote for. I will. Let me just tell you real quick. No, I won't. I will not do that. Uh, Here's what I would tell you is you should vote. And just a reminder that that's Tuesday. If you haven't filled out your ballot yet, make sure you do that before Tuesday. Now, I told you I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I do want to tell you about a politician. I want to tell you about a politician, a leader, uh, who kind of led a pretty typical, or I guess I would say stereotypical, uh, politician's life. Uh, Basically grew up pretty humble beginnings, uh, worked in the family business, and and kind of, i got to be honest, probably wasn't the most qualified to be a politician, but was really just kind of picked. And, And as... As he kind of progressed in politics, just became more and more and more popular. And and to the point where people would attend his rallies and just like chant and cheer for him. He was was more honored and more revered and better thought of than the incumbent. And eventually he he took over. But when he he took over and we kind of reached that pinnacle of political success, he had some of the same problems that some of our politicians these days have. He had had some extremely embarrassing public moments. He had some some moments where his actions probably should have disqualified him as a politician. 
He had some, even committed some crimes that he probably should have been tried and convicted of, but because of his position of power, that didn't happen. But, but not, only, not only was he a, a well-loved, well-respected politician, he was also an incredible author. He was a gifted musician. And, and he wrote beautiful poetry contained in multiple volumes in the Library of Congress. Just amazing. And one day, one day while he's sitting, writing poems, looking back over his life, the, the good parts, the bad parts, the highs, the lows, all of it, he writes a poem that started like this. This is what God is to me. He is, and then before I tell you what he said, I wanna ask you a question. What would you put in that blank? If you had to answer that question looking back, this is what God is to me, he is. I think some people here, some people might say that he is a friend. Some people might say that he is a savior. Last night someone shouted out, he's love. And I think that some people might say that he's worthless, that he's distant, that he's dead to me. Some people might say he's my buddy, he's great, or I guess he's better than nothing. See, when you look back at your life, maybe just the past couple of years, how would you describe God? What word would you use there? Now, this is what God is to me, is actually a paraphrase, my paraphrase, of a poem written by that politician, King David, second king of Israel, God's chosen people. A poem that's in our Bible as Psalm 23. And this psalm is a metaphor that David is writing, comparing his life and his relationship to God as that of a shepherd and a sheep. This is something that David knows a lot about because while he was growing up, he, that was his job. He was a shepherd. He took care of his father's flocks. So for the next four weeks, we are going to look at and lean into this poem and dig into what it means for Jesus to be our great shepherd. We're gonna look at four things that Jesus does as our shepherd. This week, we're gonna talk about how Jesus leads us. And this is what I like to call like a, a sit and soak hot tub passage of scripture, okay? That might sound weird, but I, I love a hot tub. And in a hot tub, you sit, you soak, no hurries, no worries. It, it's just warm and awesome. And if you don't like hot tubs, you're like, that's weird, Kendall, fine. But this is a hot tub passage passage of scripture, we are going to sit and soak in it today, and we are going to let it kind of just envelop us. The rest of Psalm 23 isn't necessarily that way. There's other parts of the Bible that aren't necessarily that way, but for us this week, we're going to realize, and we're going to come to find out that Jesus meets our need when we let him lead. Jesus meets our need when we let him lead. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever been lost? Have you ever been lost? I want you to think about a time in your life when you were lost. Maybe it's when you were a kid. Maybe you got lost in a store. Maybe you got lost somewhere. Maybe it's when you were older, you were in the wilderness and got lost. Or on a bike ride and got lost. Or on a walk and got lost. Maybe you were in a city that you didn't know and got lost driving around. But I want you to think about Today, what were those feelings that you had when you were lost? What were you hoping for? Like, what were you hoping would happen while you were lost? And, and specifically, what were those feelings? Were you lonely? Were you scared? Were you angry and annoyed? Like, I want you to allow yourself to feel. Feel some of those feelings that you experienced when you were lost. Most people don't know this about me, but uh, I have had some very interesting rides in the back of a police car, and uh, it, more than a few times in my life, which is really weird, and I'm not a criminal or have a checkered pass or anything like that, but, but one of those happened because I was lost, 
And I'm gonna share that with you at the end of our service, but I just know that when I was in that situation, I can even today feel the fear and the anxiety that I experienced that wishing someone would find me, wishing someone would help me get back to where I was supposed to be. And the reason I wanna talk about getting lost is because sheep have a tendency to get lost. And when we're talking about a great shepherd, we have to talk about sheep as well. And maybe you've heard this before, that, that sheep are stupid. Like they're the dumbest animals around. That is not true though. Sheep are actually very intelligent. They just have a tendency to get distracted. They have a tendency to just wander off. And in fact, the problem is that when sheep wander off and when a sheep gets lost, they don't realize that they're lost. And they don't have a tendency to try and find their way back, they just continue wandering and continue getting more and more lost. Unless a shepherd goes to look for the sheep, they won't be found, and they will be in a great deal of hurt. Huh. That sounds like me sometime. Does that sound like you? Have a tendency to get distracted, have a tendency to wander off, need a great shepherd to come and bring us back. See, when we talk about Jesus, when I talk about Jesus, I think of Jesus, I, I think of Jesus that he loves me, that he loves us, that I think of him as someone that can help us out when we're in our jam. I think, of, I think of someone that's my savior. I think of someone who's almost like a superhero, right? I often don't think of Jesus like a shepherd until I read Psalm 23. And in Psalm 23, David describes the shepherd this way. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. After I read that to you, I wanna ask you a question. Who is your shepherd? See, David, pretty simply here, he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So who's your shepherd? Because David, as he's been through highs and lows in his life, the highest of the highs, the lowest of the low, he looks back and refers to the Lord as his shepherd. And, and now, Psalm 23 is written a long time before Jesus. But later on in the New Testament, in the book of John, one of Jesus' closest friends, John, wrote down that Jesus described himself as a good shepherd. The description in the book of John is in John 10, and we're gonna jump in and out of John 10 today as well, where it says this in verse one. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. See, sheep were kept in pens, and they were walled off, and there was a gate that the shepherds would come in and out through. But if someone jumped over the wall trying to steal a sheep, they weren't the shepherd. They were trying to steal a sheep. They were not trying to do what was best for the sheep, meaning there are different shepherds, there are different voices, there are different people trying to lead us that are not Jesus, that are not the good shepherd. But other shepherds, they don't want what's best for the sheep. Going on, it says this, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, I asked you to fill in the blank of who God is in your life, but I want you to think about this blank too. Who's your shepherd? In other words, what person are you listening to? So many voices, so many leaders, other shepherds that probably aren't the great shepherd. Shepherds that we maybe shouldn't be listening to. Now some voices are good, that's fine, but some voices may not always give us as good of information as the great shepherd would. Let me give you three examples. The first one would be our own voice, right? We talk to ourselves, sometimes in a good way, but sometimes in a not so good way. 
Sometimes we don't want to listen to the things that the great shepherd wants to tell us. We don't want to listen to the things that the Bible says to us. And, and we're, we're just gonna do what we want to do. Not so good to listen to our own voice in that situation. What about the voice of culture? The culture that we live in, where it basically says, if everyone's doing it, and if everyone believes it to be true, then it's fine, we, we can do whatever, it must be okay. What about a relationship? Where instead of listening to the voice of the great shepherd, you're listening to that person's voice more than Jesus. If we start listening to other shepherds, here's the problem. We're going to miss out on the second half of verse one in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other version, it says, I lack nothing. See, because here's the deal, Jesus is all powerful. Jesus is fully God and fully man. Jesus was always been and always will be. Jesus heals people, Jesus performs miracles, Jesus raises people from the dead, and Jesus can meet any of your needs. If, if you're listening to and following the great shepherd, he's the one who's going to give you all the things that you need. I started out my message by saying that Jesus meets our need when we let him lead. But this only happens when we're following the great shepherd. Try it. Follow some other shepherds. See how quickly you will be let down. See how quickly they don't have your best interest in mind. Try this. Try to follow the shepherd that is the Republican Party. Try to follow the shepherd that is the Democratic Party. Try and follow the shepherd that is your Amazon subscription. Try to follow the, the shepherd that is your bank account. And as you will see, and as it's described in John 10 that we're gonna look at here in just a few minutes, they will let you down. They will not take care of you. They will not give you the things laid out in the rest of Psalm 23 because those things only come from the great shepherd. Those promises only come when we are following and being led by the great shepherd. Now, once we have realized that Jesus is our shepherd and once we've decided that we're going to follow him and once we realize that what then must be true is that we are sheep. That's right, you are a sheep. Now, right now, that is not a very popular position to be in in our culture. In fact, both sides of the political aisle are referring to the other as sheep, saying that we shouldn't be sheep, we should be lions. Each side thinks they have the moral high ground and we're poking at the other side. But here's the problem. There's only one lion, there's only one shepherd. And that's God. And when we put ourselves in the position of God, we are going to have problems. We weren't meant to be God. We were meant to be sheep. So let me tell you something about sheep. Now, like I said, you may have heard that sheep are stupid, and that's not true, but sheep do have some very interesting characteristics and personality traits. And I wanna address them alongside of Psalm 23 because David, he wrote he, out of his own understanding of what sheep need and what he needed from God to take care of himself. So in verse two and three of Psalm 23, it says this, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. The shepherd does all of those things because sheep, sheep need a shepherd. Sheep don't exist without a shepherd. There are like very, very few, if any, wild sheep in this world anymore. Yeah, there's, there's bighorn sheep and mountain goats and stuff like that. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like actual sheep because sheep have kind of been like livestock since the beginning of time, like in the Bible, right? And sheep have come to a point where they need a shepherd, 
They need the help of a shepherd. And one of the main reasons they need a shepherd is because sheep will not be able to rest on their own. Sheep will not lay down, they will not relax, they will not sleep unless four things are true in their lives. I wanna give you those four things. The first one is this, that they are free from fear. Sheep are extremely nervous and skittish and jumpy and they will not lay down and rest unless they are sure that they are safe. The second thing, they're free from conflict within the flock. There's a hierarchy within flocks of sheep and and they basically kind of work that stuff out on their own. The shepherd kind of knows how it is, but if it's not solved and if it's not resolved, they will not rest until it is. Number three, they're free from pests, bugs, gnats, flies, parasites that can make them sick, all of those things. If that's bothering them, they will not rest. And number four, they have to be free from hunger. They have to be filled up. In other words, sheep can rest when they lack nothing. Now I said there's four things there, but two things have to be true for those four things to happen. The first is this, there needs to be other sheep, okay? Sheep live in flocks. If you think, oh, sheep, that'd be cute. It'd be cute, fun to have a sheep. I should get a pet sheep. Just bring one sheep home, it will die. Sheep can't live on their own. They live in flocks. They were made to live in community. Oh, just like us. And maybe some of you are trying to do life on your own outside of community. That's not how you were meant to live. And then the second thing is that they need a shepherd. They need a shepherd to do all that work for them, to make all of those things happen. It says the shepherd makes them lie down in green pastures, and the reason the shepherd can do that is because he has met all of those needs for them. If you see a picture of sheep out in a green pasture, like that's the kind of picture you would expect to see. Oh, that's beautiful, that's so great. But here's the deal, that if If sheep were allowed to stay in one pasture or one section of a pasture for too long, they will absolutely destroy the pasture. They will eat all of the plants, all the grasses, all the green. They will turn it into dirt. They will eat the roots under the dirt and turn it into a dry wasteland. So what happens is a shepherd needs to lead them to different pastures, to different places, A shepherd can't leave the sheep in the same place too long or they will destroy it and it will no longer be green pastures. It will no longer be a place of rest. These pastures, they would also be sources of water. There would be water somewhere in the pasture. Number of things, there could be a stream, a river that runs through where the sheep could drink. There could be uh, a, a lake or a body of water there or even shepherds would bring their sheep out early, early in the morning while the dew was still on the plants and the sheep could eat enough of the grasses and of the plants with the water on them to have the water that they need. As sheep, God wants to lead us to places where we can rest, where our souls can be restored. And this isn't a singular one-time thing. It says he leads them to pastures. He leads them beside still waters It's not like you show up, you make a decision to follow Jesus, he gives you the food and the water that you need and sends you on your way for the rest of your days. No. This is something that happens over and over and over again. You're being led to pastures where you can rest. You're being led to quiet waters where you can be refreshed. Daily, God wants to give us rest. God wants to restore our souls. In January, we're gonna gonna give you some really practical solutions. We're gonna talk about Sabbath for the month of January. You're like, well, great, Kendall, that's two months from now. 
Yes, two months of the most crazy, stressful time of the year for most of us. So I wanna challenge you. What if we really tried for the next two months, we really tried to slow down, to not give in to the crazy that we know is coming. And we actually listen to the great shepherd daily as he tries to lead us to places of rest. And if we don't, if you don't listen to the good shepherd and you listen to all those other shepherds around you, like let's talk about the voice that's with inside of ourselves here. Our own internal dialogue, here's what that says, we'll never be good enough, we'll never get finished, we'll never be able to slow down, we constantly have to do more. The cultural voice around us is constantly changing what it means to be successful, what it means to be good enough. Relationships, relationships show you, they put demands on us of what the person wants us to be like and what they don't want us to be like. There is no rest in the voices of those other shepherds. But we are not meant to run at such a frantic pace. God has designed us for ongoing rest, for ongoing restoration of our souls. The, the picture here of quiet waters, it's not because sheep can't drink out of a river or they can't swim or anything like that. No, no, no. This is just a beautiful picture of peace written in the form of poetry. John 10 says it this way, when he has brought out all of his own, his own sheep. He goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. See, God recognizes that you are a sheep and he recognizes that you need a shepherd to lead you, to make you feel secure, to make you sure that you lack nothing and then to be able to allow you to rest and to allow your souls to be restored and refreshed. Jesus meets our need when we let him lead. So what do you need? That's exactly what you need. You need rest. You need to live at peace with God. You need to live at peace with the people around you. You need for your soul to be restored. Think about that. If you had all of those things, a lot of life would fall into place. And there's a suggestion of how we can do that. We need to follow paths of righteousness. Psalm 23 says this, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Those paths, those right paths, they will give us rest. They will help us to live at peace with Jesus and the other people around us. These paths, they're, they're central to the rest of the poem. The rest of Psalm 23 doesn't work unless you're on the paths of righteousness. They direct us when things get difficult. They lead us to celebration. They make sure that we experience goodness and joy throughout our lives. And we only get there. We only get there when we're led there by our great shepherd. On your own, on my own, we won't pick paths of righteousness. We won't pick the right path for very long. A couple of years ago, true story, there was a group of shepherds that were watching over a flock of about 1,200 sheep. They, they took a lunch break and left the sheep on their own. While they were doing that, the sheep found a path, started following the path right off of a cliff. 1,200 sheep walked directly off of a cliff. 800 of them survived because their fall was padded by the 400 that went over before them. Not one of them stopped and said, we probably shouldn't walk off this cliff. We see this over and over throughout history. When people stray away from God, they make messes of their lives. We bring pain into our lives, but when we follow the paths that the great shepherd leads us in, these right paths, these paths of righteousness, all of our needs will be met. 
Now, shepherds, they often lead sheep in circles or in switchbacks. If, if they're going up a hill, shepherds would never just like charge up the hill with the sheep. The sheep wouldn't go for it. They'd, they'd tire out. They'd, they wouldn't be able to make it. So what they do is they lead them around the hill or switch back, back and forth across the hill slowly, gaining ground, slowly moving higher and higher. Here at Eastern Hills, in our growth trek, we actually have a section called switchbacks, which is where some of that is happening, where it just kind of feels like we're doing the same thing. But what is happening is this. The sheep, they don't know what's going on. They don't understand. They're quite content walking in circles, but the shepherd is bringing them to a better place, to higher ground, to a better pasture, and a better place to find rest. When we try, when we try to stay on the right path by ourselves, when we just go and do the work, and we've got to work really hard, and we've got to do the right things, and we've got to say no to this, and we've got to say yes to this, and when we do all of those things, doing our best to stay on the paths of righteousness, We're working way too hard. We should be like the sheep, enjoying the walk, following our shepherd, knowing full well that even if it feels like we're going in circles, even if it feels like we're constantly going through hard times, that that we're getting better, that we're getting better, we're getting higher on the hill. We're getting to a place where there's better pastures, where there's more rest for us, because we're listening to the voice and following our great shepherd. But here's the thing, our shepherd, he's not gonna be like they're disciplining us, forcing us up the path where we don't wanna go. No, he leads us. He doesn't push from behind. He calls his voice that we recognize from out in front. And the way that he does this is described three different times in John 10. It says that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. We only get the freedom. We only get the security and the safety. We only get to live a life where we lack nothing. When we get, we get that because the great shepherd lays down his life for us. All the other shepherds, all the other voices, they don't care about us. They won't protect us when hard things come. They won't be there for us when life happens. It says when the wolf comes, the hired hand runs away. But Jesus didn't. Jesus died on the cross and came back to life so that we can be free from rules, so that we can be free from sin, so that we can be free to follow him on the right paths, which are so much better for us. And then it says this, it says all of this is done, leading in right paths, taking care of us, providing it for us, for his name's sake. Not for me, for him. None of this is my doing as a sheep. It is all because of the shepherd. It's all because of him. In order for us to experience true rest, in order for us to have a renewing of our souls, in order for us to be transformed, in order for us to experience righteousness, it has nothing to do with us. It's all about Jesus. It's the great shepherd. It's not about the sheep, and we have to recognize that we, in all of this, our role to be the sheep. Can you go back to the story of when you were lost? See, when sheep get lost, they are in a world of hurt. There's no shepherd to protect them. There's no one to lead them to green pastures. There's no one to provide for their needs so that they can rest. No one to get them back on the right path. No one makes sure that they don't get distracted. A lost sheep is scared to death, and death is actually coming pretty quickly. 
for that sheep. That's why in Matthew 16, we read this parable where Jesus talks about the shepherd leaving behind 99 sheep to go look for the one, the one that's lost. You and I were that lost sheep. Jesus came to look for us because he loves us so much. He wants to lead us. My story of being lost, that was pretty scary. I was in first grade. First grade, my family, we moved from a rural part of the state of Washington to a big suburb of Chicago. I had never ridden a school bus. In my new school, I had to ride the school bus. So on the Friday before I was gonna go to school, my parents, that morning, they brought me to the bus stop. They showed me how the kids get on the bus and where they go. And then that afternoon we went when the kids got off the bus and, and they walked home. And so then we got, walked home three blocks about to my house. It was all good until Monday. Monday, I went to school. Everything was good. I came home. I got off the bus. I walked two blocks and turned left. I needed to walk three blocks and turn right. And although I was one block from my house, nothing looked right. Nothing looked familiar. I might as well have been on the other side of the world. And as a first grader, I was scared. I didn't think I'd ever go home. Now, luckily, inside the house that I was standing in front of was an older couple, very nice. They saw me out there crying, upset. They came out, asked me what was wrong. I told them I was lost. I gave them my address. They'd never heard of the street I lived on, even though it was one block over. I don't know what was wrong with them, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Maybe they were new to the neighborhood too. So what they decided the best thing to do was to call the police. So they called the police, the police showed up, and when the police got there, also never heard of my address, my street. I'm like, come on, what is going on? Anyway, they said, well, how about you get in the back of the squad car, we'll drive around, see if anything looks familiar. So we drove off the street, made a left. Oh, there's my house right on the corner, right one block away, that's where, that's where I need to go. So we pulled up in front of my house. I'm sure my mom was freaking out at this point because you know I was late, it was the first day of first grade in a new school and I was coming home in the back of a cop car. <laughs> but I wish, I wish there was someone there who knew the way home, my mom or my dad or, or a shepherd, so to speak, that could make sure I was safe, make sure I was protected and well taken care of. Because when we are in scary situations, it's important to lean into the shepherd. It's a scary time right now. Our pastor is preaching at a different church this weekend, trying to figure out and discern whether he should be their pastor. Our country is more divided than it's ever been as we go into an election on Tuesday. We are just coming out of a global pandemic that completely changed societal norms, how we interact with each other. We're in the middle of record inflation that has ruined our budgets, wondering how we're gonna make Christmas happen. These are scary times. So let's, let's follow our great shepherd. Let's lean in. Because Jesus meets our need when we let him lead. Now, what, what better way to put this into practice than by celebrating communion together today? If you're a follower of Jesus, we would love for you to celebrate today with us and remember that all of this, all the stuff we're talking about, it all happens because of Jesus. All of this is for the sake of his name. This celebration is a beautiful picture of unity. Celebrating Jesus' death, his coming back to life, unites us. Who you're gonna vote for on Tuesday divides us. Because here's the deal, someone in this room is going to vote for a different senator than you're gonna vote for. And someone's gonna be happy and someone's gonna be sad. And that's gonna be dividing. So instead of making it about senators, let's make it about a shepherd. Because if it was about us, we are in trouble. When we wander off the wrong path, the right path, when we listen to the voices of shepherds around us, when we, when we don't rest, it, it, 
If it's not about Jesus, then we're in trouble. So we pause, we take time to remember his death on a cross, his coming back to life so that we aren't doing this on our own, but we are being led by a great shepherd. So here's what I wanna do. During the next song, when you're ready, just come forward, grab the bread, grab the cup, bring it back to your seat. We'll eat and drink together at the end. But before we do that, I just wanna read you Psalm 23, the whole thing. I want you to close your eyes and just just sit, just rest, just listen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me Beside still waters, he restores my soul. How many of us need our souls to be restored? He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you, You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. God, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 